What's up, everyone? Adam Ronis here. Another edition of Meet the Family here on Fantasy Alarm. And today I have the unfortunate pleasure of being the host with none other than Howard Bender. Howard, what's going on? How are you, Adam? Appreciate you, uh, you, you taking the time again here to uh, join us for another Meet the Family fun and exciting things. I, I have nothing to say, though, today. I just Oh, well, that's, that's great. So then we can make this brief because I did have something I was supposed to do, and you asked me to come on. And how could I not be here with Howard Bender? I got to say, I, did you lose some weight? Uh, yeah, I got my ear pierced, so okay. that drop was about 10 say. pounds. You, you do look like uh, you lost some weight there. I figured at home with this broken foot, you might be eating more. I'm 100% eating more. I have zero. That's why I'm wearing, I'm wearing the hoodie right now. So it kind of it masks really what's what's going on down in the midsection. Okay, that makes sense. Because, yeah, your face doesn't look healthy. You look like you lost weight, but your, your face, I don't know about that. Uh, but, yeah, there's you know, there's a lot of stuff that I don't even know about you, you know, We've kind of known each other for a while, but not very well. We obviously have been working for Sirius X and Fantasy for some time, but we really didn't work a lot together. We've had discussions here and there. We had a little rivalry because, uh, you know, I was hosting with Lisanne since her inception on the station. Probably we've been working together, I think, about six years now. Um, and then somehow you got a show with her, which was the JV show compared to our main event. And we kind of got into a little bit of a rivalry, which was all fun. But there's probably a lot of things that I don't know about you as well. So we're going to learn a lot about you today. And I probably will as well. I, I hope so. I mean, listen, this is uh, I'm, I'm an open book. Or at least I try to be an open book. I'm sure I'm sure you'll find some way knowing you that you'll find some way to get me to uh, turn around and tell you no comment. But I uh, listen, you know, we're, we're doing these for. The, the, you know, the family for FA Nation to really just kind of get to know all of us on this, you know, personal level. It's not just about who do I start and sit in my fantasy football lineup and who do I draft? You know, we try to connect with everybody. So I got nothing to lose here. Well, I got everything to lose. And it's true. Obviously, a lot of times, you know, uh, people who have listened to us for a long time, especially on the radio, can get a glimpse into the personality. But sometimes we don't have the time to really delve in. Uh, but how about for you? I mean, maybe it's a little bit more difficult living out in isolation there in California, but I know for me being in New York and the tri-state area, I've actually become a, like good friends with several people just from listening to the Sirius XM show. And I will say this, I have met a couple of women, women from the show. So based on just hearing me on radio. So have you been able to encounter any of that, considering you're all the way out there in California, um, I actually I have. It's it's kind of funny. There's been uh, you know you know I'm a I'm a huge fish fan. So when I go out you know and I and I go to shows, um, I'll get recognized by some people and and you know they'll hit me up. I remember there was um God I was at a show in Vegas for Halloween and I was tweeting something out and the kid next to me just immediately like turns over and he, like taps me on the shoulder. He's like, Are you Howard Bender? I follow you, you know, and so, I mean, yeah, I've gotten that. Um, there was one time on, uh, there was a caller called up uh, the uh, the Elite Fantasy Show and said that he was, you know, Nick from Half Moon Bay, and Jeff Mann said, oh, do you know Howard Bender? He's in Half Moon Bay. He loves when people stop on over at his place. Look him up. <laughs> and so, actually, I mean, Nick is a really great guy, and he actually does a lot of work with Lenny Melnick now. Um, he's gotten into it, but yeah, I've, I've had my fair share of it. I mean, I usually try to kind of stay back and, and be that, you know, secluded hermit, but I get it. I get it sometimes. Yeah. You know, it's funny you said that because I remember I was at City Field and I had tweeted, oh, about to watch the Nas postgame concert. Uh, and I was actually in the press box that day with Scott Angle. Uh, we were there for Sirius XM and the guy's like, hey man, I got a suite. Uh, you want to come down? I was like, okay. And I went and that was just from Twitter. So, you know, it's kind of amazing. You know, I think sometimes we don't realize the reach we have uh, because this is a national radio show and a lot more people listen than we think. Uh, I've run across people who have said, oh yeah, my friend listens to you on the radio. And it's just crazy. I was in vacation in Bermuda and I was in 
the you know off the the ship because it was a cruise, which no one does anymore. Obviously, <laughs> cruises are kind of done. So I'm in the sh- shop with uh, my girlfriend at the time. She's looking around shopping. I really don't shop like that. I don't care. So you know, you know, she's looking around, and somebody comes up to me and he goes, oh, "Are you Adam Ronis?" I go, "Yeah." He goes, "Oh," and his wife's like, "You've made my husband a lot of money." And he goes, "You mind if I take a picture with you?" I was like, "Oh, sure." And then I go, "How'd you know it was me?" He goes, "Well." I saw you the other day and I thought it was you because I saw the ponytail, but I wasn't 100 percent sure. Then I see you today with a Noah Syndergaard jersey. So I figured it was you <laughs> but in Bermuda, man, on vacation. Like, think about that on a cruise. It's crazy the reach that we have on, on uh, Sirius XM. It really is, actually. You know, and it's kind of I mean, I, I don't know how, how you you've handled it. I know that there are some who think that, you know, oh, everybody should recognize me. I, I, I'm more of that mindset of like it's still a little surreal for me like it's really like i'm i'm on a i'm on a national radio show with jim bowden gm from the reds and the and the nationals you see him on tv all the time and you know and and that whole aspect and then yeah not really you know i i I don't consider myself a celebrity like that's that's the thing and i've had people be like yeah you're a total celebrity and it's you know relative to you know what you do and i guess yeah you know being on the radio it does kind of help that out but i mean listen i am and i always will be uh put my pants on one leg at a time like everybody else and well i, mean, I don't you know what's that not now you got no, no no i'm pantsless right home. now I'm, you don't please, need pants <laughs> who wears pants when they're when they're working from home that's just not necessary all right how old were you when you got married? Why did you do it? Ooh. And do you regret it? <laughs> <laughs> you said you're gonna tell the truth. I don't know if your wife's around, but let's let's do this. Oh, she's out with the dogs right now. Okay. So there's zero chance she's watching now, but the now, replay but she is might see the replay. See. Hi, no, Mrs. I love my wife. So here you go. Here's the here's the the, the rundown of it. I first met my wife in uh, 1990. Four, oh and goodness. she was when I got out of college. It was yeah, it was late ninety three, early ninety four. I got out of college. I needed a job in New York. I moved back down to to New York City, and I needed a job. And I, you know, went looking for a bartending gig somewhere. I was, you know, in school for uh, for graduate school for theater, and I met her at um, and you'll know this uh, Jekyll and Hyde down on Seventh uh, yeah. Avenue South. Wait, so, okay, there's aren't there two of them? The, there's one on 57th and 6th also, which opened okay. up in like 95 or something like that, um, which I worked at that one, too. I actually told a story, you know, I've, I've got a, a story to tell on the show later on today on Sirius XM about that. But I don't want to I don't want to spoil it. Don't ruin it. I'm not going to ruin it. I'm not going to ruin it. But nevertheless, um, I met her there then and, uh, and I was immediately smitten. And we. um we stayed good friends for a couple of years and uh, she, she had went, you in the friend zone. <laughs> she kind of had me on the friend zone. We were in very different places. I was still right. very much thinking that I was going to be some big shot actor, you know? And I was like trying to take my craft somewhat seriously. Um, drinking took care of that, but that's a whole <laughs> different other story. But nevertheless, so we stayed, we were really good friends at that point. We, you know, very nice uh, inner circle of people. We partied together all the time. Um, we started dating in like 97, I think. She went to one place, I went to another, and then we kind of both re-met. And we started dating there. We dated for about two years, two and a half years, and then we broke up. She broke up with me. You believe that? Believe no, I'm that? not surprised. I'm surprised it took two years. <laughs> I was surprised it took two years, too. We, you know, <laughs> Nevertheless, she broke up with me. She broke my heart. We decided we wanted to stay good friends. We were all still, we were still like, you know, we were touring with Fish together, our still our group of friends. We were playing in the same Sunday night poker game uh, the entire time. So not oh, one of us. Second, long- hold on. So she broke your heart, and you remained friends with her. I did. I didn't want to listen. I didn't want to give up going to fish shows with all my friends, and I didn't want to give up my my Sunday night poker game. So it was you know try and be an adult about this and get over it and understand that timing just wasn't right, and we were just better off not dating which was which was fine with me because you know towards the tail end when we did break up yeah it broke my heart but you know there was that piece in me that was like uh, uh, 
I'm, I'm good worry. I'm, I'm good not worrying about this anymore. And so that was that. And then five years went by and, uh, and she and I just, we remained friends and it took a little while for, you know, everything to get back to normal. But then, yeah, after about five years in like 2000, I don't know, maybe like 2003 or something like that, we got back together and uh and that was it we uh, we returned to each other we were like listen if, if we're gonna do this now then this is it we're we're good to go and uh and we're getting married and and that's it and we actually just continued dating for a number of years afterwards i don't think i got i got married in 2006 so i was 36 years old at the time when i got married and uh yeah but i mean you know she's been like my main squeeze since you know the 90s so basically, she decided, you know what, I kind of have to explore the market, see what's out there, mess around. And then I guess she figured, all right, well, he's not so bad. So that's basically what happened, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, is this the last dude I'm going to ever sleep with? 100%. 100%. No, I mean, listen, you know, I don't I don't regret it at all because I've always been, you know, enamored with her. And it's, you know, I feel bad for the girls in between who like, you know, I, I dated this one girl like in between the whole thing. And every time we got into an argument, I kept calling her Deborah. Oh, boy, that is <laughs> yeah. bad. Right. Yeah. So it's like walk out, you know, like head down, walk out. I'm done. I lose this argument. Call me when you uh, when you cool off kind of thing. But, you know, getting back together with her and the whole recycled relationship made it the easiest thing because we knew each other's we knew each other's shit I, I there's no better way to say it. i knew her you know quirks and personality defects she knew all of mine and we kind of you know maintained that uh that aspect and i married my best friend so no listen i'm i'm still very much smitten i do not regret being married i do not regret not being one of those guys who doesn't screw around i'm very happy where i'm at she's a very very cool chick um, I think you would actually, you would probably get along with her because you two would just sit there and bust my balls the entire time. Yeah, oh, we would, definitely. I mean, I'd do it anyway, so if she's just going to add on to the fire and pile on, great. All right, so you kind of answered a little bit. Uh, I was going to say, have you ever cheated on her? And if you did, would you even admit it right now in this broadcast? <laughs> um, I think I would. I, I think I would admit it. I mean, I don't think... I was bartending the first time that we dated. I was bartending and some girl like, you know, laid like a big smooch on me. And I ended up just kissing this girl like you sure at the it was bar. a girl. 85 <laughs> percent. You know, she had an Adam's apple that was as big as her balls. <laughs> but I mean, that was that was that was the extent of it. But no, man, I'm, I've just you know, I've never been that guy that, you know, needs to go spread his seed and. Go fool around. With, I mean, I listen, man. You know, when you when you spend your entire time drunken partying uh, in New York City in the in the you know mid nineties, at you know like your early twenties. By the time I hit twenty seven, I was like, man, it's it's. I got to get the hell out of here. I woke up at a construction dumpster in uh, yeah, on West Fifty Third Street between ninth and tenth, and I was like, my party days are over now. So yeah, all right. Let's let's go there then. So. Like, how wild was it? And what were you doing at the time that you were able to be that wild? And was there any point where you thought to yourself that you might not survive this crazy party time? There were a couple of times I actually thought that I wouldn't survive this this crazy party time. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, it was it was crazy. I mean, it was like, you know, I was in grad school at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and I totally pissed those two years away. Because I thought that I was like, you know, Mr. Hot Shit in New York City. I was running the Jekyll and Hyde Club on 57th and 6th. Um, and that was like the hot place to be at that point. I mean, it was like like Yogi Berra showed up there because he wanted to see the club. There were celebrities and everything like that. I was interviewed. I was on page six. So, I mean, like I totally let it get the better of me. I totally let it get the better of me. Um, and I went drinking hard and... Other drugs, obviously, were, were massively in play, and it was it was a very, very crazy time. And, uh, yeah, I guess it was it was that day that I woke up in the dumpster. Uh, construction guys throwing their empty coffee cups on me, which is what woke me up. And, uh, and, yeah, I just basically said I got two choices. I can either check myself into a program or I can just man up and 
stop drinking. And I ended up going dry for a number of years afterwards because I just, I knew that I needed the help. Oh, I didn't, I didn't even know that. That's something that I learned. So, and how about since then? How have you been? Uh, I don't really, I don't even know if I've seen you drink alcohol. I don't think so. Right. I think you saw me have a white claw at, yes. uh, at the FGA. But no, I don't. I, I'm 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 not a drinker. I mean, if I if I have a beer, it's like a beer, and I'll nurse it for a few hours. But I am not. I, I just I don't drink anymore. I'm a smoker, not a drinker. And you know, again, it's legal here in California, so not that it really matters whether it was legal or not. I was you know puffing away as it was, and I'm you know I'd much rather do that. I'd much rather roll myself a joint or do a bong rip than even like you know pop open a good bottle of wine and that all stems from everything that happened back in your mid-20s like that oh, was yeah. kind of the wake-up call it was uh, you know bad drunk like i mean sitting at the blarney rock on uh you know over by the garden on 33rd street west 33rd just being that disgusting decrepit you know like mid-20s kid who you look at and you just like feel really bad for that you know that how lost is this is this soul and i mean i would literally i would this is how bad it got. Just to, to put it in the, I was so I'm tending bar downtown Union Square at Heartland Brewery. All right, I am living out in Brooklyn at the time. Uh, I am opening up. Uh, uh, I'm going to the bar at 10 a.m. around the corner from me. I'm drinking till about 3:30 in the afternoon, straight through. I go to work. I show up. I'm behind the bar. I drink all through work. Then I get out of work, I go out, I party for the rest of the night, I come back home to my place in Brooklyn, I pour myself a pint glass of vodka that I had in the freezer, I drink that, I pass out, I come to, and I do it all over again. So, Did anyone, did anyone like friends or close family reach out to you and say, you know what, you have a problem? Because I've actually seen a couple of people who told me afterwards that they went you know, they had alcohol issues and I didn't know at the time. Uh, one was an Irish girl. So I just assumed, hey, you know, they like drinking, uh, you know, not to they did. They do. Right. I never thought anything about it. And then someone pointed out to me, we were at a Super Bowl party like it was wrapping up and she was drinking. And then afterwards it came out. And then one of my close friends uh, also recently went through um, getting treatment. And I had no idea. Again, you see you know, people 20, 30s, they, they go out and drink. You think nothing of it. So did people reach out to you and say, hey, look, you got a real issue? Was it apparent to people? Um, it was very apparent to people. It wasn't, you know, like the, the, my guy friends who I was partying with, they just kind of let it go and just, you know, that was it. But well, what happened was, was, you know, when I realized that I was like really having some issues, um, Deborah was actually my manager at Heartland Brewery. And she basically turned to everybody on the staff. One of the things that she had said to me, because, you know, the flirtation was going back and forth and whatever. But she's like, she's like, I'm never going to get with you when you're drunk all the time. And, I, you know, whatever. And that kind of, you know, hit home a little bit. But when it started getting really, really bad, um, she basically turned to everybody on staff and said, if I see Howard with a drink, I'm going to assume that, you know, it was somebody here and you'll all lose your jobs. She's like, I care about him. He's a great guy. Uh, he's been a good friend of mine for some time. And, you know, he needs help. And you guys just, you know, giving him a drink or at least just letting him pour his own isn't doing it. And she actually, yeah, she was one of the people who uh, who helped pull me out of it. So she was on drugs when she said those kind things about you, correct? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe she was. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe she got kicked in the head by a mule or something like that at some point. And... <laughs> but yeah. All right. So I put out this poll several months back. It was about asking about uh, proper time for getting engaged. And of course, people started hitting me up thinking that I was getting engaged. Foolish thoughts. I don't know why they thought that at all. But I basically said, what is the proper amount of time before you get engaged? And obviously, it depends on the situation. Um, I don't want to call you an expert in marriage because, you know, yeah, you've been married for a while, but you haven't dated for a while. So things kind of change. But I put out like one to two years, two to four years, four or more. Uh, so as someone who has been through this process, even though it might have been 20 years ago, whatever it was, 
what do you what's your take? Do you kind of know right away, hey, this is the one? Does it do you need a couple years before you get engaged because you got to get to know that person? Does age come into account? You know, if you're like 40 to 50, is it shorter because you know yourself better? What's your take on getting to know someone proper time for engagement leading to marriage? I think the older you are, the more you know about yourself, the more comfortable you are in your own skin, the less concerned you are about the optics to the rest of the world. Like I couldn't care less what the rest of the world thinks about me right now. I mean, I, I, I am, I'm me and I'm who I am and, you know, take it, you know, take it or leave it. You know, I, I, I think I'm a, a pretty good guy. So <clears throat> when you're older, I think it, it makes it a little easier when you're younger my feeling is, is that you have to you, you've got to be dating for to me at least a year before you can even think about it possibly even longer but for me <laughs> one of the big things you got to live together you got like I know back in the day it was frowned upon to live together in sin blah blah, blah but you know you're not going to go buy a pair of shoes without trying a pair of shoes on right you're not going to go Drive, you know, buy a car and not take it for a test drive and see how it feels. And in all honesty, you don't know a person fully until you live with them. And I mean, that's like day in, day out. You know each other's schedules, you know each other's habits. And that's like then all of a sudden, okay, if you're not killing each other after like two years of living together, then I think you're pretty safe to get married. So I'm in like that one to three year range for engagement and marriage. And I think that that should kind of help it along. But I always recommend that you got to be, you got to be older. These days of like getting married at 22, 23 years old, Sorry. that's pro that's programming from the older generation telling you that that's what they did. And that's, that's what I thought I needed. When I was, you know, in college, and I was like, "Oh, I'm dating this girl in college," which means I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna marry her after, you know, after school. No, it's it's not like that. You gotta, you gotta be older. You gotta be more experienced. You gotta be more secure with who you are as a person uh, before you can start, you know, having somebody else count on you. Do you uh, do you know right away? You think that someone is ready for marriage? I mean, is the right person for you? Does it take time? Like, if you're not in love with someone after a year, is that a red flag? Of course that's a red flag. <laughs> of course that is. I mean, listen. Okay. You know, uh, so what's the proper amount of time that you fall in love? Well, like, I mean, here, here's the thing is that, you know, when you fall in love, when you really care about somebody that deep, I mean, that that you should know. And it shouldn't, you know, I mean, it shouldn't really take a full year to be like, hmm, am I in love with this person? I mean, listen, sex can be great and you can have the best sex in the world with a person. But let's face it, if you don't want to, like, spend the whole next day with her, you know, and you're like, oh, yeah, we had a great romp in the sack on Friday night. But Saturday I'm going, I'm hanging out with my boys. I'm doing my own thing. I just want to be alone, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like, if you genuinely don't want to be with her, like around her. And, you know, the, the next day or the day, two days afterwards, ever, then maybe it's not, you know, marriage, probably not the best thing for you. Yeah, I think that's pretty appropriate. So that, that's a that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> how did you get your start in fantasy sports? You mentioned you wanted to be an actor and I could have told you that was a horrible idea. So I'm glad you kind of realized it at a certain point. But was that your first passion then? Was acting was what you wanted to do when you were young? That was the first thing? Dad? Is that you, Dad? Is that? <laughs> I, but you know what? Acting, I took an acting class in college. It was fun. Um, I, obviously, I never pursued it, but that would be, like, if I was given a list, I would want to do it for sure. I, I don't know if it, it's not everyone's passion, but was that your first passion when you were young in college, coming out of college, was going into acting? I did. Man. I loved it. You know, I mean, here's the funny thing is that I was definitely I was, you know, sort of class clownish and I loved doing the, you know, the the acting. I loved the applause. And I really yeah, I mean, this was something that I was really intrigued by when it came to, you know, doing all the stuff in high school. And then I got bit by the stand up bug my senior year of high school. And this is something I actually had a story I told on the air uh, the other day, and well, everybody listening now is going to know the spoiler that you know it, it was a true story. I did an open mic night. Um, I just I, I was like, screw it, I got to do this, I got to try it out. And I did an open mic night, and it, it it killed. I mean, you know, listen, you know, you they they always say 
because I talk to a lot of comedians, you know, having like, you know, gone to clubs and just kind of, you know, bullshitting with them at the, uh, at the bar. And it's always the same. It's, it's just say what, you know, it's what your experiences are. And that's what's going to, if you, you know, if you're, if you're lying on stage, everybody's going to know and it's not going to work. And so my, my original routine was all about a lot of masturbation, striking out with girls, um, you know, pressures from uh, an overbearing father and, you know, like all of that stuff. And it killed and it played and it worked so beautifully. And I was just that that was the bug that bit me there. And uh, and, you know, and I did some some open mic night hosting and I just kept trying to ply my trade with that or just have some fun with it. But for me, it was more about playing off the crowd, really, than it was about writing my own material. And so writing material kind of got a little bit more difficult. And again, then I went off to college for, you know, for theater and I majored in theater and I originally was supposed to be pre-law and I dropped out of that my freshman year. I was like, I can't do this. I'm not having any freaking fun in college right now. Taking taking six classes my freshman year and they're all like con law classes and, you know, aggravating stuff like that. So I was like, that's ah, just not for me. And that's when I ended up saying I was going to major in theater. Grad school and then, yeah, just kind of like, you know what it was, man? I was on the top you know, on top of the world as a as a bartender in New York and I was, you know, it was party central and it was just it was like the first time that I really like got a chance to let loose. And so I chose partying over being like committed to headshots and classes and auditions and stuff like that. And that kind of phased out. So as I was going through all of that in the uh, I guess it was like mid to late nineties when I started you know, my poker game, we started talking about doing a fantasy league. One of the guy's dad uh, invited us all to join this league, and I ended up joining the league there. And so, you know, you read all this stuff, and this was like, you know, back with like CBS Sportsline, it was like Al Melchior and Dave Ganos, and, you know, those guys were all just kind of starting off also. And I was reading a lot of that stuff, and I was like, listen, I'm winning in my league, and I'm educated, and I don't want to sit here and tend bar the entire, you know, my, my entire life, I've got to do something. And so I just kind of plied my trade and I just, I you know, started up a blog and, and I started writing every time, you know, every night and then just sending out as many links as I possibly could until finally, um, it was Ray Flowers who was with Fanball at the time who hit me up. And then he, you know, he introduced me to Eno Saris over at Fangraphs and, they introduced me to the guys over at Rotowire, and then it all kind of snowballed from there. Do you regret not pursuing the acting and partying and doing the bartending and really, I guess, not fully committed to it? Do you ever sit there and say, man, I kind of regret that, that acting was really what I wanted to do and I never really gave it a good shot? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, really. I mean, listen, I love what I do, and you know, and I, and I get to do, basically I get to do stand up on, on the, on the radio. And when we do these live streams, I can screw around and, and do that sort of thing. You know, there's, there's, yeah, there is a little piece of me that kind of misses it. And I've actually thought about, uh, getting back into it and actually like just doing some stand up at, uh, you know, and, and just kind of applying my, you know, just working at it and just seeing what happens uh, for the sake of seeing what happens. But I think I, I incorporate enough of that theater background into what I do in the fantasy sports world as well. So you really, I guess you didn't really do a lot of stand up. You obviously was, were up on stage. And I, I think it was an interesting point you brought up about the whole kind of playing off the crowd. That's what I look at when I go to a lot of comedy clubs in New York city. And I like to see if someone messes with the comedian, how they respond. It's easy to not easy, but you have written material. If your delivery inflection is good, you can do well. But the real talent is when you get tested by the crowd. And most of them usually excel at it and play off it really well. But I think that's the biggest challenge because uh, I always thought about it too. But it's the written content. I feel like I'm better just interacting and playing off what other people say. So how was that challenge when you had to start doing write writing comedy material? Um, like writing in the fantasy world? No, 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 writing comedy. If you got to that point, I know you said you did like a... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I would like write out, you know, jokes and scenarios. But see, like, I never like, I, it's, I didn't script them at all. It was just like, okay, 
here's, you know, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start talking about what, what it was like at Thanksgiving at, at my house. And, you know, and I would just write myself some notes about, you know, nobody wants to sit next to Aunt Mary. And, you know, this, you know, this person's a, uh, an acid dropping deadhead. And this person here um, is, a, is a little bit racist. And, you know, kind of doing that and talking about, you know, that aspect. So I always had, I had some notes for myself and I, you know, I, I didn't always try to bring them on. I didn't want to bring them on stage because, you know, you see comedians who sit there and they've got like the books and stuff like that. I feel like if, if you know, if you're, you know, yeah, it's a good reminder to do that, but I never wanted to always do that. But, I, you know, occasionally I would, you know, do like the crib notes on the hand and just be like, oh, don't forget to, you know, Thanksgiving or, you know, Hulk Hogan imitation, you know, whatever the case may be, I would just kind of do it that way. And so, you know, for me, again, it was just, it was telling the story and it was like painting the picture uh, for me. And then, you know, dealing, you know, and seeing what the crowd's doing, if the crowd's into it and if they're not into it, immediately like jump to a different story. But I never really scripted stuff out for myself right now. It's like, you know, building a show sheet for, you know, the fantasy alarm show. I'll put some notes in there as far as what I want to talk about, but Everything needs to be up here for me. So if you had the ability to do one thing right now, what would it be as a career or a job? And you're going to tell me oh, what I'm doing now. I love it. Stop with that crap. I, but I do. I, I See, here's the I thing. Mean, I do too, so I can't lie. I, do too. I love being right. on the air. If you had to do anything but what you do now, what would it be? Oh, all right. <laughs> if I had to do anything, I mean, I'd marry myself a super rich broad, and I would be a, a well, be an realistic. animal no rescue. Super rich, no super rich woman is going to get with you, bro. I don't know what you see that you bring to the table. Now, women are different. They are into personality and sense of humor, so you might be able to get over on that. Um, women women are just different than men. They really are. We're, we're way more into to looks and everything. Uh, women idiots. are not. What? We're we're idiots. We're shallow. We're stupid. I've accepted I, uh, that. I so some people. I mean, I still look for intelligence and sense of humor in a woman. If she's in, if she's a moron and looks great, that's only going to last like a week. Yeah. You know, a so, week. Look at you. you know, maybe two <laughs> weeks. It depends. It depends on how big booty is. You know, let's uh, be honest. Maybe, well, is that right? You're the big booty guy. Oh hell yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you're a breast guy or a booty? I'm a breast man. I'm not going to uh, lie. I'm a breast man. Yeah, nah. They, that's like maybe, I mean, yeah, the bigger the better, sure. But it might be fourth on the list. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot I was supposed to look for any questions, if anybody had any questions. I don't think anybody, look at that. Thank goodness, no. Yeah, because we can get you in more trouble, I see. That's why. <laughs> So you mentioned how, you know, you started to get into fantasy networking a little bit, uh, meeting different people. Um, so tell me about your first few gigs and how that translated into you getting where you are now. Oh, all right. So actually very, very cool. By the way, Dan Ferris told me to say teach. And I did, I, you know, I, I'll say this. I, I taught, I substitute taught in, in Manhattan for about a year and a half, two years. Oh, really? I hated it so much. I mean, wait, wait, how did, so how did you get into that? Didn't you, don't you have to have a, they weren't, you know, at that point they were dealing with all that shortage. And so, right. you know, I needed to get certified, but I didn't need to like go to school and, you know, and, and do that because I had all the, uh, all the college credit already. So I got like temporary certified for substitute teaching because they were just in such a pinch at that point. I mean, this is, yeah, like, 97 98 maybe and um yeah it was uh it was it was interesting it was they, they had me in middle school with seventh graders and my lord man i can't remember i i mean i remember what kind of an a-hole i was at the age of 13 14 years old these kids topped it no doubt about it so i was, so that, teaching was, that a, was, was that a deterrent to having kids oh yeah i mean that was part of it that was part of it you know it was i my my choice to not have kids, it was actually, it's kind of funny because I always thought that I did want kids. And then I started realizing just how much baggage I was carrying from my parents and from my childhood and, you know, dealing with, you know, all of that, that, 
you know, I was like, man, this is just, and then also because, you know, I was, you know, doing acting and I was bartending. I never was, you know, financially sound enough to even feel comfortable about raising a child. And so, you know, I just, I, I, it wasn't something that interested me, uh, very much. And, you know, when my niece and nephew would like come stay with, you know, Deb and I in New York, I, you know, for the weekend, like, They'd stay over on Friday night, and by Saturday afternoon, I was like, dear Lord, just please pick up your kids, because I can't take this anymore. Uh, they're driving me up a wall. So, yeah, I didn't I didn't want to have uh, kids like that. Um, but that's not what you were asking before. You, what did you ask before? Oh, my original, my starting gigs? Yeah. I was doing player notes for Rotowire. I was covering uh, the Niners and the Royals, and that's how I got my gravy boat nickname, Derek Van Riper. Because every time I would write a player note about uh, Billy Butler, whose nickname was Country Breakfast, mm -hmm. I always tried to incorporate that into it. And so, uh, so I was doing that. I was writing three articles a week for fan graphs. I was getting my comedy out doing my Kicking Rocks column, which was all satire and tongue-in-cheek, which took a lot of the fantasy nerds a while to pick up on. You know, they were just like, they, they weren't getting the sarcasm in the written word, and you know, I wasn't about to, like, let them in on the secret. So I was doing that, and then, uh, so I was, I think it was, like, 2010. I was working for Fanball, Rotowire, and Fangraphs, and then I started, I was bartending at a place called Gordon Biersch down by the ballpark here in San Francisco. And the FSTA back then, F Fantasy Sports Trade Association, had their event there. And uh, and I ended up, like, you know, Peter Schenke from Rotowire was there, so I got to meet him. So I was bartending this event. And, I mean, literally, like, word got around to everybody that I was in the business as well. So Mark Hanna from Real Time Fantasy Sports, he came over. He, wanted, he asked me about, you know, working for them and doing a weekly column. They wanted me to do a column called The Weekly Bender because he thought it was great. Bender, bartender, and do that whole thing. Uh, Jeff Manns, was, uh, he and uh, Ryan Hallam were at Fantasy Alarm. And uh, I met them, and Jeff gave me his card, said, you know, look me up. And I ended up, I ended up walking out of there with a stack of business cards like that thick. I ended up with like four or five more freelance gigs. Meanwhile, Rotowire's now pounding more and more stuff on top of me. And so finally, you know, I just, I got to that point where I turned around and I said, you know, these are my three main places, Fangraphs, Rotowire, and Fantasy Alarm. And I said, I, I'm looking for a full-time gig. Whoever, you know, whoever has it available for me, you've got my my loyalty, my dedication. I'll always, you know, and Rotowire had a policy at that point where they were only, you know, all, all their full-time guys had to be in Wisconsin um fangraphs really wasn't ready to bring anybody on full-time for rotographs uh you know jeff and uh and al williams and rick wolf over at fantasy alarm said that they were you know looking to expand in certain things and they needed somebody to come on full-time and i had already been working with them freelance and that was uh that was it and so i quit every other job and it's been fa nation ever since and you've had no uh thoughts of leaving at any point or have you been offered anything else or or is this just you know felt like the right fit and you never even entertained it i mean this felt like the right fit i've never shopped myself around i mean you know it's not what my, I heard. wait what'd you hear I'm just, I'm just i was kidding. gonna say the only time <laughs> i thought about quitting was when we were like hmm should we bring adam ronis in and i was like hell no and they were like nah but i mean it's ronis and i was like hell no they had, to, they had to, like, you know, tie me down and say, you're, you're staying. Um, no, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm a very loyal person. You and I have actually had this conversation before in the past. Uh, loyalty, you know, loyal to a fault. And not even, I don't even consider it a fault. But with being able to have the full-time opportunity with Fantasy Alarm, the platform that they've given me, uh, the radio show, and everything that I've done uh, with them, no, there's, I have, I had no reason to, uh, even think about exploring other other avenues. I never reached out to anybody. You know, even when I found out, you know, Rotowire was like, well, we're doing full time stuff, but um, you know, you don't have to live in in Wisconsin anymore. There was no thought whatsoever of saying, 
oh, let me reach out to these guys and and hit them up. I believe in 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 the work that we've got over at Fantasy Alarm. I believe in the concept. I believe in the community. And I, in all honesty, it might sound a little hokey. Really wouldn't trade it for for anything in the world. I mean, I'd trade it for no coronavirus right now. But, um, you know, I mean, I really, it's been a great home, and and it's hopefully and the only one I'm going to call home for fantasy sports. I know we talked about it a little bit earlier in the week, but now we see there's probably going to be no sports for quite a bit. So how have you handled that adjustment? And I think it's going to get more difficult in the weeks ahead. I, you know, it's crazy. We've, we've only been into this like a week now. It feels like seven months, but it's only been a week. So how have you handled that? And what have you been doing? Uh, obviously, we're still doing work here, but it's not – if we had baseball going on now and spring wrapping up and the season about to kick off, we'd be like crazy in drafts and all this news. So we don't have that, even though we are still supplying content and adding to the draft kit every day. But obviously we do have a little bit more time on our hands because there's no games to watch at night after we do our work. So how have you adjusted and what have you been doing to pass the time? Um, you know, I mean, the broken foot totally sucks because I would be spending a lot more time out on the beach with my dogs. I really would. Um, I hate you're allowed being, to go? what's that? You're allowed to go to the beach. I thought you're, it's kind of a lockdown. No, no, no. I mean, you know, no, you're technically not allowed to go, but I mean, if the beach is empty and I want to take my dogs out for the beach for, you know, an hour walk on the beach, which is what my wife's doing right now. Don't arrest her. Right. Uh, you know, then, then do that. Take a walk, uh, even just going up the street. You know, we've got, you know, to live in a very rural farm community, Thing. So, you know, take the dogs up for a walk, you know, up the street to go visit the, the local emu and the chickens and the horses and the cows and stuff like that. But, I mean, because I've been so sedentary because of this, I uh, I, I took a guy's suggestion, you know, um, he and, uh, and my friend Lisa Ann used to always sit there and talk about curb your enthusiasm. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm jealous maybe of not being included in that conversation. I don't know. Maybe. But I started watching a lot of Kirby. I started binge watching that. And, uh, and then you told me on Mondays, meet the family with you in practical jokers. Dude, show is killing me, man. Right. I love it. Absolutely love it. Because, you know, at first, like Sal kept getting the punishments, like yeah. the main punishments. I was like, man, is this guy going to be like the lovable loser the entire time? But like four episodes in, and all of a sudden the other guys are the ones getting the punishment. Big fan of that. I mean, I'm really I'm trying to I'm trying to immerse myself in that. I'm trying to be creative with stuff that we're doing here on the site with these meet the family uh, things. We've got a, a new show called uh, Getting Buzz that's going to hopefully debut next week. So I'm trying to do creative things with uh, you know with the community here. But I mean, as far as like me at home, it's a lot of TV watching. A lot of TV watching. All right. Now, you were born in New York City. Are you from New York originally? Yes. Okay. Now, so was I. I was born in Queens and basically was in New York my whole life. When I was 24, I moved to Florida for a job at a newspaper. And growing up in New York, the fast pace, everything open late, and going to laid back Florida at age 24, I couldn't handle it. I was there seven months. I'm like, I got to get back to New York. And I came back to New York. So you grew up in New York. How have you handled leaving New York to California? What's the stark contrast? And what brought you out to California as well? I almost lost my mind for the first couple of years out here. I really, like, there is zero sense of accountability with, like, a huge sense of entitlement. Like, I live in San Francisco, therefore every. The city should do everything for like it boggles my mind. Um, you know, it's just it's it's very there's no there's no real hustle out here. Like you know, I've I talked to guys who are you know in like the software industry and they'll like they'll do a deal for like you know twenty five thirty k and then they'll live off of that money and not work at all and just surf or do whatever they're gonna do. Until that money starts running low, and then they go and they make another deal, and you know they do something like that, like that. You know, I've I've always been a grinder. I've always been a hustler in in that aspect. So yeah, it drove me, dude. It drove me nuts out here. I literally, 
I was like, man, I want to kill somebody. Um, it was super easy to get bar jobs out here. Apparently, all you need to do is make eye contact. Like, if you make eye contact throughout an entire conversation with somebody, A, they're a little intimidated by it, and B, they take you more seriously. Um, and so, you know, moving out here, I mean, we moved, when we moved out here, we moved out to like Ocean Beach, which I don't know if you know anything about San Francisco. No. But like, you've got like moving to Ocean Beach, we kind of, it's kind of similar to like living in the Rockaways. You know, it's like there's no, you know, no other boroughs, but, right. you know, San Francisco shaped like a fist here. If uh, you've got this area here is like the wharf and where the park is. I was like down here, down by the zoo. So I was just I didn't want to move. I wasn't moving from New York City to live in downtown San Francisco. That just wasn't it for me. Um, my wife and I wanted to be on the beach and that was what we did. This was like, it was like the, you know, we wanted to get out of New York. New York was pricing everybody out and it was a huge hassle. And, you know, that, that didn't hit San Francisco for like a couple of years after we had moved here, but it obviously did. It happened about, a, you know, 10 years afterwards, um, which is why we ended up moving down to Half Moon Bay. But, you know, when we moved out here, I just, I didn't want to like live in, I wasn't moving from one, from the city to another city. And uh, and that was kind of what it was. But I mean, it was like it was the mothership basically calling us home. I'm a deadhead. My wife's a deadhead. Both, you know, list to fish all the time. Music is a big part of our lives. And, you know, for me, I could write anywhere. Didn't matter um, for her. She wanted to be a part of the uh, the music scene uh, in San Francisco, where it all kind of started for her. So, you know, that's that's where we uh, that's why we ended up out here in San Fran. And when did you leave New York to go out there? 2007. February of 2007 is when we made the move. So when you come back to New York City, obviously you've been out here for Tau Wars, FST events. Like, do you miss it or do you come back and go, oh, I'm so glad I left this. Too many people. Crap. Like, how, how are you with that? Well, when we have our FSGA events at like the Crown Plaza in Times Square, then I'm like, ugh, gross. But I, I I do I love New York City so much I miss it I I go and I you know I go to Grace Papaya on 86 and Third and oh, get I, a hot dog. I figured you would go there. Uh, who wouldn't? Come on, it's the best <laughs> hot dog in the city. How many can you eat at once? How many? I don't know. I've never really tried. I'm built. You know, I'm built for comfort, not for speed. So oh, okay. You so know, you like would, the whole you wouldn't enter the hot dog like, eating contest. Nah, it's not nah. for me. It's not for me. I'd rather go up there, get you know four dogs. You know. Two with mustard onions, two with mustard sauerkraut, sit there, eat, go around and, you know, spend the rest of my day. But I always get pizza. I always get bagels. I always go for Chinese food out there. So I eat my way through New York every time I go back for a visit. I'm not surprised by that at all. Well, look at the size of me, dude. I mean, <laughs> listen, I'm, I, you know, like literally. I, I healthier guess, than me. What's that? You're probably healthier than me. No, I don't think I am actually. Really? Dude, I live off of Red Bull and Five Hour Energy and candy. Why do you drink so much Red Bull? You know it's not good for you. All that sugar? Oh, no, sugar free, baby. Sugar oh, free. If you really think it is, that's what they tell you. Right? It's like saying that a hot dog is real meat. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> come on, man. It's like toenails and so rat hair. You need so you need Red Bull to get through the day. Um, I, I mean, I just I, it's at that point right now where, you know, because for the, the, the longest time or whatever in, in this industry, it all bases off of East Coast time. News starts at 8 a.m. So there I, it's like five in the morning here. And then what I would do also is that when I was, you know, grinding, I would work all throughout the day. I would go 10 bar for a couple of hours and I'd come home and I'd work through the night until I got everything done and taken care of. Rinse and repeat. Living off of like two hours sleep, so yeah. Is, it, is like is that like anyone in the fantasy industry who's been involved since like late two thousands, two thousand ten, two thousand eleven? I think we've all been through that. I mean, I remember basically having twenty hour days when I first yeah. started doing the morning show because I was working at Newsday and that was a night job. So basically, I'd have to come home and catch up on all the news for the morning show. So basically, my day was. Waking up at 4 a.m., going to bed 2 a.m. And, and I'm not joking about that. It was lit literally that's what I was doing. It feels like a lot of us who have been in this industry for 10 years plus, 
uh, who had to multitask and did not have this as a primary source of income when we started out, probably had to go through that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's, it's, it was the hustle. It was what you wanted, right? You wanted to work in the industry full time. That was what we did. I mean, again, now we talk about it's a super saturated market. Or anybody who makes ten dollars playing DFS thinks all of a sudden that they should be, you know, writing a weekly column and getting paid, you know, eighty grand a year to to do that. It's just not the, you know, it's just not the case. When we were first up and coming, you did. You needed you needed the the side hustle. You needed to to pay the bills somehow because fantasy certainly wasn't doing it. But again, if you if you're looking at it from what your 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 end game hope is. Then you power through it. I mean, again, I also had the luxury of having a wife who was making a really good living. She was the GM of a of a of a thousand person live music venue in in San Francisco. She was, you know, running places in New York City. She was, you know, it, it afforded me the ability. Now I still had to ten bar, you know, four nights a week, five nights a week to, you know, help make ends meet. But, you know, I mean, it still it it allowed me to, you know, say, oh, well, I, you know. NFL free agency starting today. I'm going to get my shift covered at the bar and let somebody else take care of it kind of thing. And how has your role changed over the last few years at Fantasy Alarm? Um, well, I mean, you know, it's just, it's gotten obviously busier. I've done, you know, I mean, doing the radio show uh, five days a week and I was actually doing the Sunday night show as well um, for yeah, a I number of years. Canceled. With Lisa Ann, I, I was the one who ended that. I said, you can't have her getting worse working with Bender. But now, but that was before we worked together. If I had known that we were going to form, I would have left it. Sorry. It's so hurtful, man. It's so <laughs> hurtful. I mean, wow. <laughs> it stings. It's going to leave a mark. I know. Gonna... <laughs> oh. Uh-oh. Corona. I think I'm having a nosebleed. I just got tagged. Oh, jeez. Kick in the nose, man. Um, sorry, what was your – how's my role change now? Yeah. Technically, I'm your boss. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I can go – I got Rick. Hey, Rick, how are you doing? You know, I can go to him. So – You can be my – you want to be my boss? You can be my boss. Listen, you know, how's it changed the you know i'm i'm not writing as much as i used to i'm still trying to you know get in a, a number of articles here and there a lot of my writing is found in the draft guides for nfl and mlb um you know i mean doing the you know more dfs stuff has really kind of shifted you know, away from some seasonal because obviously the dfs packages and the playbooks and stuff like that those are you know let's where a lot of the money is in the industry and you always want to keep, you know, the, the clientele happy. So, you know, I've, I've shifted a little bit more DFS for fantasy football wise, um, writing a little bit less. I mean, prepping the shows. I mean, listen, you, you know it. I mean, it's, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a two hour show, a one hour show, a three hour show. I mean, you still need to be really on point with all of your content. You need to know certain things. You can't just be sitting there, you know, People can hear, you know, and next to the microphone, you know, if you're flipping around sites and you're, you know, and you're trying to look up different things like that, you know. So, I mean, to me, you have to have all of that knowledge, you know, upstairs. And, you know, it's like no different than with stand up. I need to know somebody's ground ball rate. I need to know somebody's, uh, you know, strikeout rate. So, I mean, things like that. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time, like I'll wake up in the morning and, you know, you take care of some administrative stuff and make sure that site's running properly and, you know, everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, a lot of overseeing. But, you know, while that's all being weaved through, it's just me just basically studying uh, as much as I possibly can to make sure that the show is is good, that it's sound and it's, you know, also entertaining. And I can attest to that. We've only done a few shows together on Sirius XM, but your rundown is very thorough. I have worked with people uh, who is who are the lead host and had no rundown. And obviously, it made it tougher on me. But I was, you know, I'm usually up on everything because I, I eat and breathe this. But a lot of people would have never been able to work like that, not knowing what's coming your way. And there was one or two occasions where it was really the dumbest thing where it was a segment where you needed prep, 
and it was just thrown upon me. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing, man? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, you could tell, in fact, someone who was a seasoned um, in the radio industry asked me one day, he's like, uh, that guy doesn't prep for the show, right? I'm like, yeah, how'd you know? He's like, I can tell, I can hear it. So, um, yeah, and I think even just a, a savvy person would figure that out. Here's something I want to know. Because of sports wagering, has that altered the way you feel about DFS or the amount of you play? Are you more into sports wager now? Has it lessened your enthusiasm for DFS? Is it the same? How has sports wagering affected your DFS outlook? It's interesting. I mean, because I feel like DFS and, and sports, I, I feel like sports wagering is is replacing DFS for the common man. Like you're always going to have, you're always going to have guys who are multi lineup entry people in DFS and they actually don't even play it like fans of the game. They play it like they're playing the stock market and they'll, you know, they'll throw in 150 lineups and they won't care if, you know, one or two of the guys isn't even in the lineup. I saw winning lineups for MLB with a guy who's like in the minors who wasn't even going to see an at bat. Why? Because, you know, min price. And, and that was just, you know, the, he was able to do it because he was popping in 150 lineups into the contest. Um, you know, I think that people are going to understand that at some point where they're going to be like, you know, I would much rather, rather than spend seven hours constructing a lineup that could win me, $20 in a GPP if I come in, you know, 103rd, um, you know, I'd much rather just put 20 bucks on the game, you know, and, and, and go with that. So I feel like, I feel like that's what we're going to end up seeing a little bit more of. So, you know, for me, sports wagering, I've never been a guy who needs the action. Like I, I, I respect the hell out of you for knowing all the in-game betting and, and everything that you do with that and what you bring to the table, you know, for that. That was definitely obviously one of the selling points of, you know, hey, let, Adam Ronis needs to be over here at Fantasy Alarm. I mean, I love sports wagering. And, you know, Craig Mish and I, we play in the, uh, in the Westgate Super Contest and the Golden Nugget. And, you know, I look at futures all the time and, and work it that way. Um, so for me, it's more about, helping people along smartly wagering, like not, I don't understand. Like people who like are sitting here right now during this time and they're freaking out. So what are they doing now? They're, they're betting esports or they're betting uh, horse racing or they're betting uh, EPL English premier league soccer. And they don't know anything about it, like nothing about it. And that to me, that's just not smart. That's get help, like seek help on something like that because you know, if you really have that kind of an itch that you need it scratched and you'll do it on a, on a game you don't know anything about that, that's not for me. And so, you know, I'm always like, you know, I'll, you know, deal with some best bets during baseball and futures and I'll put a couple of them out there of saying this is what I'm doing. But that's also another thing as well, is that there are way too many people out in the industry right now who are trying to latch on to the sports wagering because that is the future of our industry. It's been like that. And they're just throwing out bets all willy nilly. They're not playing what they're saying. And I don't respect that. I like, I have a problem with people, you know, who do that. And if like, you know, if, if you track some people in the industry who are doing that, you're like, how many times are you reloading your account? If you're betting what you're saying that you're, you know, the, what calls that you're making here, Man, you're you're you know you're showing people how to lose their houses. You're not showing people how to like be intelligent about this. You can make money betting. You just have to be smart and disciplined. Yeah, it's something that I've said continuously on the radio about that. And in fact, uh, again at at alarm, we we show everything. A wager alarm. I mean, I was giving out the NBA picks. Uh, probably started. I don't know. Was it mid late January? You guys asked me to do it. I said sure because you guys knew I was doing it myself and. Um, up until the point of the stoppage, it was like 12 games over 500. And I was playing those picks, putting them in parlays. Uh, so we document everything here. It's all time stamped. You see it, you know, would be posted anywhere from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, hopefully we get to do that again when the games resume. But we'll leave you with a wagering proposition here. I want to ask you, over or under three years, do I get married? Over or under, what are you going to take? You? Yeah. 
I'll take the over on that. Okay, that's pretty I, bad. I think you know. I think I think you. I think you know. You're, you're you're dating. You're enjoying what you're doing right now. You're having a good time. Um, I think yeah. Like I think when you end up deciding to get married, you're older. And it's more about the companionship than it is about like, hey, we're going to start a family together type thing. So I'll put the over on that one. I think that's a pretty good wager. I uh, want to thank Howard for the time. This flew by. It was a lot of fun. We're going to continue to do these here on Fantasy Alarm. Check us out in the meantime. People are still doing fantasy baseball drafts. We're adding content every single day. I have a draft on Sunday. We're doing our home league. I did a draft Wednesday night. I did an NFBC auction last Sunday, so there are people out there that are trying to pass the time. We're here to help you. In fact, I'm updating my rankings. I took Chris Sale out. I took Tyler Beatty out. Uh, so I'm going to continue to update my rankings. I know there's not a lot of news, uh, but make sure you check us out. We'll have more of these live streams and videos, a lot of ways to entertain you. So thanks a lot for joining us, and we'll talk to you soon here on Fantasy Alarm.